Hello, my name is Charlie Heaps. I'm the developer of Leap. and I want to welcome you to this follow along video for Leap training exercise number one. In this exercise, my colleague Chris Malley from SEI York will take you through exercise one of the standard Leap training exercises. You may want to get yourself a copy of the exercises uh, in PDF format. You can get them from this address, leap.sei.org slash training. And once you're using Leap, you can open the included Freedonia dataset and then use menu option area revert to version to see answer keys corresponding to the end of each section of the exercises. The PDF version of the training exercises look like this. So I'll pass over now to Chris. Good luck. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this tutorial for the first Leap training exercise. In this tutorial, we're going to provide a step-by-step -step guide to complete the LEAP Exercise 1 titled Introduction to Fredonia. In this exercise, we're going to learn how to model energy demand and energy supply for a fictional country, Fredonia. We're going to learn how to project that energy supply and demand into the future for a baseline scenario and for a mitigation scenario. And we're going to quantify the greenhouse gas emissions coming from our energy supply and um, demand. So we're doing this exercise one here. So in order to illustrate how LEAP can be used in a variety of contexts, we have structured the data in Fredonia to reflect the characteristics of both industrialized and developing countries. For example, the urban population in Fredonia is fully electrified and living to uh, OECD standards, while the poorer rural population has limited access to modern energy services and, and uses biomass fuels mainly to meet basic needs. In order to simplify the exercises, we've also reduced the number of sectors in exercise one. So for example, in energy demand, we only look at the residential sector and, um, and there's no agricultural energy consumption that has uh, been entered either. So the first thing that we need to do to um, start this exercise is to create a new LEAP data set for Fredonia. So in section 1.2 of the exercise, we create this new LEAP data set. So we can do this by opening up Leap and clicking New. And we're going to create a new Leap dataset called Fredonia New. And then click OK. We'll then ask us, do we want to review the settings? And we're going to click Yes. So under the um, scope and scale option, we're going to have transformation and resources checked because we want to look at energy supply. And we have energy sector effects and energy, uh, uh, energy sector effects checked because we want to look at emissions coming from the energy sector. In years, we can set up the time period over which we want to conduct this analysis. And we're told in section 1.2 that 2010 is the base year, the first year of our analysis, which it is already in settings. The first scenario year is um, 2011, which was already been set. And 2040 is the end year. We are not going to look at costs in this exercise, but for later exercises, the monetary year is 2010 and the first depletion year 2011. Then we can click close. Section 1.3 starts by creating our data structure for the energy demand analysis. The energy demand analysis we're going to do in this exercise considers only the energy used in Fredonia households. We're going to start by developing a set of current accounts, that's historical um, energy consumption, that looks at the household energy use in the most recent year for which data is available, that's 2010. 
We're then going to create a baseline scenario to examine how the energy consumption patterns are likely to change in the future without any policy interventions up to 2040. Then we're going to develop a policy scenario to examine how the energy consumption can be reduced by the introduction of energy efficiency measures. So if we go to um, section 1.3.2, we're then told information about our current accounts um, for Fredonia households. We're told in the year 2010, Fredonia's 40 million people are living in 8 million households. Of these households, 30% are in urban areas. So we want to start by creating our branch structure in LEAP, creating the tree structure that allows us to estimate the energy consumption from our household sector. We're going to start by right clicking and clicking add to create a branch called households. And then because we have information in, in the exercise in section 1.3.2, on how those households are split between urban and rural areas, we can, um, we can create sub-branches under households for both of those categories, for urban and for rural. So we can then enter this first piece of data. We have 8 million households. So the first thing we need to do to enter this data is to change the units that are used for households. It's not percent share, it is the number of households. And we have 8 million of them, which we can enter like this. Or alternatively, we can enter it as 8 and we can change the scale to million. They are equivalent, there's no difference between them. We then have for urban and rural areas, the percent share of households. That's exactly the units we want for this data. And we know that 30% are in urban areas and the rest are in rural areas. Now I could write 70% there, but I'm going to write remainder 100. This expression, this little equation, takes the values uh, of urban, in this case, and subtracts it from 100 to give us the value for rural, in this case 70. And this can be very useful when creating scenarios, as we'll see later, because if we change the number of urban households, the number of rural households will automatically change um, with it. If we look further at section 1.3.2, we then get more information about the urban households. We get information about cooking, about lighting, about refrigeration and other electricity consumption. We're told that for cooking, there are electric stoves and there are natural gas stoves that are used. For lighting, all urban households use electricity, for refrigerators and other devices, electricity is also the only fuel that is used. So we can now start to build our activities within urban households that consume energy. And we have four of them. We have cooking, lighting, refrigeration, and other. And we can now put in the information on the proportion of households that do each of these activities. To do that, we need to change the units here. So we want to say what percentage of households do each of the um, activities, but we don't want it to be a percent share. We use percent share where we're splitting a variable like the number of households between into different categories that need to then add up to 100%. But in this case, with urban households, we're not doing that. We are saying what percentage of households do each of these activities. And of course, households can have lighting and they can cook and have refrigerators at the same time. 
So in this case, we want to change the percentage to percent saturation. So that each household can, we can specify for each activity what percentage of households are doing that activity. And for cooking, we know that all households have um, some type of cooking device. We are told that all urban households use electricity for lighting. So in this, in for cooking and lighting, our percent saturation is 100%. For refrigeration, we're told that 95% of households use refrigerators. So we enter 95% for the percentage saturation of refrigeration. And all households have some form of other device, so we can leave that at 100. The next step is to then specify the fuels and technologies that are used for each of these activities. So for cooking, we have two types of fuels, electric stoves and natural gas stoves. And I'm going to enter these as a technology with an energy intensity. And here I need to specify my fuel, so electricity is correct. And I can then type in the name of my technology, electric stoves. I'm going to do the same, adding another technology in this case, natural gas. And my technology is gas stoves. Now for lighting, refrigeration and other, I have just one type of fuel or technology, electricity. So I'm going to enter a technology here. Electricity is my, my fuel that I'm using. Refrigeration, the same. Electricity is the fuel that I'm using and electricity is the fuel that I'm using for um, other energy consumption. So now we have two pieces of data that we need to enter for each of these fuels and technologies for each activity. We have the activity level, so what percentage of cooking is done on each of these stoves and we have the energy intensity how much energy how much electricity or how much gas is consumed per household cooking with this type of fuel and technology so we're told in section 1.3.2 that 30 percent of households use electricity for cooking and the remainder use natural gas and all households have only one type of cooking device. So there we have remainder 100. The electric stoves consume on average 400 kilowatt hours per household. Natural gas stoves consume 60 cubic meters. So I'm going to first change my units here to the units that are in the exercise for each of the fuels and technologies. So I'm going to find my units and then enter the energy intensity, 460 cubic meters. For lighting, we don't have a choice about the uh, fuel, so 100% of the lighting is done using electricity. And the average household consumes 400 kilowatt hours per year. Refrigeration, again, not a choice. 100% share of households use electricity for refrigeration. And they consume on average 500 kilowatt hours per year. For other devices, 800 kilowatt hours per year is the energy intensity. So I've now entered all of my um, data for urban households for 2010 for our current accounts. Let's now do the same for rural households. 
A recent survey of all rural households, both electrified and non-electrified, indicates the following type of cooking devices are used. So we can see here that we have charcoal, LPG and wood stoves are used for cooking. We are also told in the exercise that only 25% of rural households have access to grid connected electricity. So we have two types of households in our rural sector. We have electrified households and we have non-electrified households. So let's focus on the electrified households first. Now we're going to add in a branch for electrified households. And they have the same um, activities as for urban households. We have cooking. We have lighting. We have refrigeration. And we have other energy consumption. For cooking, we have three types of technologies, charcoal stoves, LPG stoves and wood stoves. So this is different from urban households, but we can add them in in the same way using the technology with energy intensity branch. So we can find charcoal and our technology is charcoal stoves. We can then find LPG and our technology is LPG stoves. And finally, we have wood stoves. So we can find our fuel, wood, and then our technology is called wood stoves. For lighting, we have all, we are told all electrified rural households use electricity for lighting. In addition to this, 20% of um, electrified households use kerosene lamp for additional lighting. So we have two fuels, uh, two technologies that are being used. We have electricity, but we also have kerosene. So we're going to add in that fuel here as well. For refrigeration, we have just one fuel, electricity, and for other, we just have electricity being used as well. So we've now created our brand stru structure for electrified homes. Let's add in our data. The first information we're told is 25% of homes have in rural areas have access to electricity. 25% of households. Then we have to change our units for cooking, lighting, refrigeration and other like we did for urban households to percent saturation and enter in the percentage of households that do each of these activities. So for cooking, all households do some type of cooking, as we see in the table in, in the exercise. Lighting, all households have some uh, form of lighting. Only 20% of electrified rural households have refrigerators. So we can reflect that by adding 20% under our activity level. And other electric devices, all households have some form of other electric devices and they consume on average much less than in urban households, just 111 kilowatt hours per household. Okay. So we've entered now our percent saturation. Now let's look at entering the information for the different activities. So we are told in the exercise that electrified households and non-electrified households, 30% use charcoal stoves, 15% use LPG, 
and 55% or the remainder use wood stoves. So we can enter that information. We then have information about the annual energy intensity and it's in units of kilograms per household. So I'm going to find kilograms for each of these. And a quick shortcut, if I have kilograms up here and press control D, it will automatically be copied down to the next branch rather than having to find it again. That's a, a good shortcut to know. Charcoal, households using charcoal consume 166 kilograms per household per year. LPG 59 kilograms and wood 525 kilograms per household per year. Lighting, 100% of households use electricity and 20% of households use kerosene. This is a situation where we want to use percent saturation because we have two fuels being used in the same household. So we don't want our electricity and kerosene to add up to 100%. We have 20% of households using kerosene, but all households using electricity at the same time. For our energy intensity, we are told that electricity used for lighting in units of kilowatt hours is 335 kilowatt hours per household. And for kerosene, these households consume 10 litres per year. For refrigeration, we have 20% of households using um, refrigerators um, uh, for electrified rural households. But 100% of those households that do have refrigerators use electricity. So this value of 100% um, is what should be entered here. That's correct. And each refrigerator, the same as urban households, consumes 500 kilowatt hours per year. For other devices, they consume 111 kilowatt hours per year. So I'm going to change my units and then type in 111. And I've now entered everything for my electrified rural households. I can now begin to create my non-electrified households. I'm given information about how the non-electrified households uh, differ. The non-electrified households, because they're not collected to a grid, re rely exclusively on kerosene lamps for lighting, averaging 69 litres of consumption per household per year. So I could go through the same process and create all these branches for the non-electrified households in the same way I did for electrified. But I can also take a shortcut. I can right click and copy this electrified branch and paste it under rural households. This gives me all of those branches that I just created and I can then rename it non electrified without the hyphen non so I then have my non electrified households and my non electrified households use the same fuels and technologies for cooking so I don't need to make any changes here because the information has already been entered and is correct for lighting, they only use kerosene. They don't have access to electricity. So I can delete electricity from under lighting. And I'm just left with kerosene. And I'm going to change that to 100% of households use kerosene for lighting. And the energy intensity is higher. They use 69 litres per household per year. 
No non-electrified households have refrigeration or other electricity consumption because they're not connected to the grid. So for now, I'm going to delete refrigeration and I'm going to delete other from my non-electrified households. The final thing I'm going to do is change the percentage here. It was when we copied electrified, this percentage was also copied, which is why it says 25. But actually, it is remainder 100. And now we have 25% of households electrified, 75% non-electrified. So now that I've entered all of the data for our household sector, we can now move on to section 1.3.3 viewing results and here we want to try and see whether we can get the same results as in the exercise here in the exercise in section 1.3.3 we have our energy consumption split by our urban and rural households electrified and electrified and non-electrified and we have it split by um by um activity and by fuel in each column so let's see if when we click on results we get the same um energy consumption in total we're looking for 67.8 million gigajoules so before i click on results i'm going to click save to save my data set and then click on results so in the data set we're looking at a table so i'm going to click on table and we now need to change the parameters change what results we're viewing how we're viewing the results to get the same table as in the exercise so over in my rows I have branches I'm splitting it by branches and that's correct but I need to increase my levels to be able to look at my different activities I then in my columns I'm looking at years and that's not what is in the table in the exercise. In the table in the exercise, we have fuels. So if I look at the bottom right hand side, I see that my total energy consumption is 67.8 million gigajoules. And that's the same as in the um, and that's the same as in the exercise. So I'm confident that I've entered the results correctly so let's now move on to section 1.3.4 creating the baseline scenario so we're now ready to create our first forward-looking scenario from 2011 to 2040 we're going to analyze how household energy demands are likely to evolve over time under current policy uh, conditions. So the first thing we need to do is to create the baseline scenario. So I'm going to go back to analysis now and I'm going to click on the scenario screen. I'm then going to add a new scenario and I'm going to call it baseline. And I'm going to add in my notes that this is um, uh, to give an a explanation of this scenario. And I'm going to type that it is the business as usual development with official GDP and population projections, no new policy measures so this just provides more information about what is contained what assumptions are being used 
for this baseline scenario. So now I'm going to click close and I'm going to switch from my current accounts to the baseline scenario. I'm then given information in the exercise about how things are expected to change in Fredonia over time. The number of households is expected to grow from 8 million at a rate of 3% per year. To represent that, we are now going to use an expression called growth. Growth and then entering the percentage means that the year on year growth will be 3%. And we can see from the charts now we have an increase from 8 million households in 2010 to over 18 million households in 2040 with this 3% growth rate. We're also told that by 2040, 45% of Fredonia's households will be in urban areas. So if we then look at our urban and rural split, here we can use a different type of um, expression. This is a very common situation in LEAP where we want to specify just a few data points. We have 2010, 30% of households are in urban areas. And we have in 2040 that 45% of households will be in urban areas. Within LEAP, we have an expression called INTERP, which can be used when we have these data points along a timeline and that will interpolate between them. So the value in 2010 is 30 by saying that in 2040, 45% of households will be in urban areas. Leap then draws a straight line between those two values. And we can see that because we entered remainder 100 under rural, it is automatically calculating the difference and reducing the number of rural households. Within urban households, we're then told that there will be an increased preference for electric stoves, which means they will have a 55% market share by 2040. 2040, 55, using the interp function again to create that shift away from gas stoves and to increase the number of electric stoves. We're also told something about the energy intensity in the cooking sector. The energy intensity of electric and gas stoves is expected to decrease by half a percent every year due to the penetration of more energy efficiency, energy efficient technologies. So here we have a growth rate, but it's negative, a negative growth rate, but we can still use the growth expression a minus 0.5% per year growth rate. We're then told that as incomes rise and people purchase larger appliances, annual refrigeration intensity increases to 600 kilowatt hours per household. So now we're in refrigeration, our activity level doesn't change, but the 500 kilowatt hours is going to increase by 2040 to 600 kilowatt hours. Similarly, the lighting intensity is going to increase to 500 kilowatt hours per household by 2040. So we can enter a similar expression here, TERP 2040 500. The use of other electricity using equipment grows rapidly at a rate of 2.5% per year. 
So here, instead of using interp to specify the growth in other equipment, we want to specify the growth rate, the per year growth rate, 2.5% per, um, per year. So that's our urban households. Let's move on now to our rural households. An ongoing rural electrification program is expected to increase the percentage of rural households with electricity to 28% in 2020 and to 50% in 2040. So here we are changing the percentage of households that are electrified and the percentage of households that are non-electrified. And our intel function gives us two data points into the future. We have 2020, be 28%, and 2040, 50%. So we enter that expression in the same way. We can specify as many years as we want along that timeline, and LEAP will just interpolate between those. As incomes increase in rural households, the energy intensity of electric lighting is also expected to increase by 1% per year. So I now have my electric lighting in rural areas and it's going to grow at 1% per year. So using the growth function as before. The number of grid connected rural homes using a refrigerator is expected to increase to 2040 uh, to 40% 40 in 2020 and 66% in 2040. So now we want to go to our refrigerator sector and we're not changing the energy intensity here. We're changing the percentage of people that have those have refrigerators. So here we want to change the percent saturation. So we can use an insert function again. So we can say that in 2020. It's 40 percent. And 2040, it will be 66%. And we can see we then have this line with two gradients from 2010 to 2020, and then from 2020 to 2040. Our final piece of information about rural households is that due to rural development activities, the share of various cooking devices in all households, electrified and non-electrified, will change. In 2040, LPG stoves will be used by 55% of households and charcoal stoves by 25%, the rest using wood. So we need to make the same change twice in electrified and non-electrified households here. We need to say that by 2040, 25% of households will use charcoal stoves. So we use an insert function in the same way that we have for others here. And for LPG stoves, it will be 55%. And the rest will use wood and that's calculated automatically because we have that rate remainder 100 expression um, entered there. And all we need to do now to complete this analysis is to enter the same functions under non-electrified households. Okay, so let's see if we can view the results again. So this time in LEAP, we we'll be able to try and get the same results as in the exercise, which is shown here. Here we want to try and look at the projection of emission, uh, the projection of energy demand split by fuel. So we have our total energy demand here in million gigajoules, but then the bars are split by the amount of energy consumed as different types of fuels. So the key number, 
is to see whether we get the correct change over time up to about 180 million gigajoules and whether the split in our energy consumption is also consistent. So I'm firstly going to click save here and then click on results. And I now want to view my chart. The chart that we have in the exercise has the number of years on the X axis. So I'm going to select every 10 years to be consistent with the exercise. And it has the number of, uh, it has the fuels um, as what, is, what our bars are split into. So I'm going to select all fuels here. And we can see that we've got a graph that looks very similar to the one in the exercise. The colors are slightly different, but we can see that our total energy consumption is just below 180 million gigajoules. And it's mostly electricity with some um, LPG, with some wood, kerosene, charcoal, and natural gas. So it looks like we've entered the data correctly. But we can confirm that by looking at the tables that are included here in the exercise. So we have our energy demand in 2040 in total is 176.8 million gigajoules. So if I switch from the chart view to tables, I can now see that my total energy consumption is 176.8 million gigajoules. So I can be confident that we are, um, that we have the um, correct, we've entered the data correctly from the exercise and we're getting correct results. So we're going to move on now to the transformation analysis starting in section 1.4 and here we're going to look at electricity generation. So the transformation sector uses special branches called modules to model energy supply and conversion and we can cover sectors like electricity generation, oil um, um, production, processing and refining, and charcoal production. Within each of these modules, we then have one or more processes, which represent an individual technology, such as a particular type of power plant or oil refinery. And each of these processes produces one or more output fuels. So the first thing that we're going to do in our transformation sector, I'm going to minimize my demand sector for now. The first thing we're going to do is to characterize the transmission and distribution losses from getting our electricity and our natural gas from the power plant to our households. And we're told in the exercise in section 1.4.1 .1, that electricity transmission and distribution losses amount to 15% of the electricity generated in 2010. And that's going to reduce to 12%. Natural gas pipeline losses are 2% in 2010, and they're going to reduce to 1.5% by 2040. So we're going to um, um, enter this data using the most simple module that we can create in the transformation sector. I'm going to first click Add. We want it to be a simple, non-dispatched module one output fuel per process. That works perfectly for us. We can have our electricity transmission and distribution, our natural gas transmission and distribution. And the data that I just um, 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 highlighted from the exercise um, was expressed in terms of the percentage loss. So the efficiency data that we're going to enter here is going to be in the form of losses. And we now want to add a process where our feedstock fuel is electricity. And we want to add a second process where our feedstock fuel is natural gas. 
And we can see here that our feedstock fuel is electricity and our feedstock fuel here is natural gas. What we want to make sure is that the feedstock fuel share is set to 100%. Otherwise, our LEAP data set won't calculate. So to enter this data, I'm going to go back to my current account scenario and enter 100% for the feedstock fuel share for electricity and 100% for natural gas. Then for each process, I can enter the percentage loss. 15% for electricity and 2% for natural gas. Then I'm going to switch to my baseline scenario where we have interp 20-40, sorry, 12% as we um, as is explained in the exercise, and then 1.5% for natural gas. So here is our transmission and distribution module set up relatively straight forward. We are now going to move on to section 1.4.2 for where we create a more detailed dispatched module under the transformation sector for electricity generation sector for the electricity generation. So I'm going to right click on, transmi on, on transformation, sorry, and I'm going to create my electricity generation module. And I want to model the capacity of my different power plants. I want to enter a system load curve and a planning reserve margin, which we're going to go through now. And the efficiency data we're going to enter as efficiencies rather than um, losses. I'm going to click OK. So now I have my electricity generation sector. And we have three types of power plants, three processes um, that represent the various power plants available in Fredonia. And we have information in section 1.4.2 on the characteristics of these power plants, the capacity of the power plants, the efficiency, the merit order in which they dispatch, whether they are designed to meet the base load or whether they're designed to meet the peak load, the availability of those power plants and the historical production. So we first need to add these processes under electricity generation. So the first is our existing coal steam power plants, and they are using bituminous coal. So the name of our process is existing coal steam. The first feedstock fuel is bituminous coal. And we can see once we've added this process, we get all of the, um, all of the tabs where we can enter the variables in the table in section 1.4.2. Before we do that, I'm going to add my other power plants. We have a hydro plant. I'm going to call this existing hydro. And we have a um, existing oil combustion turbines using residual uh, fuel oil. OK, the first thing I'm going to do is make sure that I'm in the current account scenario and my feedstock fuel share is set to 100 percent for the feedstock fuels in these power plants. Once I've done that, I can begin to enter the basic characteristics of my power plants in um, into leap for each of them. So the first thing we want to do is to tell LEAP how we want to dispatch these power plants, how we want to model when the power plants generate electricity. The default here is percent share. We want to change that to merit order dispatch, 
We know the merit order of these power plants, whether they are dispatched to meet our base load or our peak load. So we're going to use that information. And to do that, we need to select merit order dispatch here. We then know the efficiency of our power plants. The coal steam power plants are 30% efficient, 100% efficient for, for hydro, 25% efficient for our existing oil combustion turbines. We know the historical production and it's provided in that table in gigawatt hours. So we're going to enter that here. 3343.2 gigawatt hours for coal steam, 1731.3 and 895.5. We also know the capacity of our power plants. We've got a 1,000 megawatts of existing coal steam, 500 for hydro and 800 for all combustion turbines. Our maximum availability is 70% for the coal 70% for hydro and 80% for the oil combustion turbines. And finally, the merit order for coal and for hydro is one. For our oil combustion turbines, they're only switched on when we have our peak demand for electricity. So they get a merit order of two. OK, now we need to say something about our electricity system. The planning reserve margin, we're told in section um, 1.4.2, is 35% for our electricity system. And we're now going to specify the system load shape that describes how the electricity load varies from hour to hour within each year. And this is a three step process. The first of these steps is to create a set of time slices that we're going to divide the year into. And we're going to divide our year into a set of nine time slices that contain a thousand hours in each, where we're going to specify what our demand for electricity is, how the demand for electricity varies. We're going to split it into nine um, time slices. So to do this, we want to go to general and we want to click on time slices. And then go to the setup screen. And we want to set our time slices using this simple method with no seasonal or daily data and just divide our time into 1000 hours. So you can see here our hours 0 to 1000. 1,000 to 2,000, 2,000 to 3,000. These years are not consecutive through the year. Hours uh, 0 to 1,000 are not in January. We're going to use these as the, the variation in the demand for electricity. Hours 0 to 1,000 have the highest demand. Hours 8,000 to 8,760 have the lowest demand for electricity. The second step is then to create the peak load shape to say how our demand varies across these um, thousand hour time slices. So I'm going to click close. And then I'm going to go to yearly shapes. And I want to create a new yearly shape for our system load curve. And I want to specify my load curve based on the peak load shape. This is going to erase the existing data, that's fine. In hours 0 to 1000, the system load is 99% of the load in the peak hour, in, hour, uh, in the hour with the, the, the highest demand for electricity. The hours 0 to 1,000 have 99% of that demand on average. Hours 1,000 to 2,000 have 96.5%. It's 825 for 2,000 to 3,000. And then it drops to 55%, 
and 11% for 8,000 to 8,760. Our minimum is set to 10. That's the minimum it can fall to. So then I'm going to click close. So I've now entered my system load shape. Now the third step is, um, is to associate that system load curve with our peak load shape for electricity generation. So to do this, I come to this tab called system peak load shape. And then I can select which yearly shape I want to use. I'm going to select system load curve. So now I have a system load curve for my electricity generation that has all the data that I've entered into it. So I've now entered all of the data that I need to to set up my electricity generation system for current accounts. In section 1.4.2.1, I'm going to now enter the data for the baseline scenario to say how electricity generation is going to change in the future. And we're given information in section 1.4.2.1 .1 as to how electricity generation is going to change. We're told that in the baseline scenario, existing coal power plants are expected to be retired. 500 megawatts of existing coal power plants will be retired in 2020 and the remaining 500 megawatts in 2030. So to represent this in LEAP, I need to first go to my baseline scenario, and I need to go to my processes. And in this case, I'm reducing my exogenous capacity. I'm reducing the capacity of these power plants. And I'm going to use a function called step to reduce the capacity of my existing coal power plants to zero by 2030. The reason I'm using step is that it will reduce the value in the year. So it is different from interp, which gradually interpolates between two values between one year and another. Step works that in 2020, it immediately drops to 500. So you can see here with my in, in the red chart, I have a thousand megawatts of coal. And then suddenly in 2020, I immediately drop to 500. Then I have 500 until 2030 and then immediately drop to zero. So that's what the um, step function does. I'm then told in the future to meet growing demands and replace retired plants, new power plants are expected to consist of new coal-fired steam plants and new fuel, uh, uh, fuel oil-fired combustion turbines. So we need to create two new processes to take account of these new power plants that are going to be built. So I'm going to go back from my baseline scenario to my current accounts to enter the data for these two new power plants. And I'm going to right click and add two new processes, one using coal bituminous, and this is going to be called new um, coal steam. And I'm going to add now um, a second new process where the feedstock fuel is re residual fuel oil, and this is new oil combustion turbine. In the exercise, I'm given the characteristics of these power plants. So let's go through our variables again. These power plants are also going to be dispatched based on merit order. So I need to change the, the um, dispatch rule to merit order dispatch. I'm then also told that the merit order is that the new coal steam will meet the base load and the oil combustion turbines will meet the peak load. I'm told that the efficiency of the 
coal power plants will be 35% and the oil combustion turbines will be 30%. I don't need to enter anything for historical production because they're only being built in the future. And I'm not going to enter anything under exogenous capacity. We'll come to that in a moment. The um, maximum availability of both power plants will be 80%. And the lifetime of both power plants is 30 years, which has already been entered. We're going to build the new coal steam and the new oil combustion turbines when we need them, when the demand for electricity becomes bigger than what our existing power plants can handle. So we don't want to specify exactly when we want to build these power plants, which is what we do with exogenous capacity. We want to tell LEAP what we want to build when we need new capacity. And we specify that under the endogenous capacity branch. So we're told that we want to build new coal steam and we want to be, build new oil combustion turbines. And we want to build new coal steam in units of 500 megawatts and new oil combustion turbines in units of 300 megawatts. So we've now entered all the data that we need to, to characterize our electricity generation system, both now and for the baseline scenario into the future. What we're going to do now is then view the results to see whether we get the same results as in section 1.4.3. In section 1.4.3, we have a graph that shows the electricity generation in Threadonia in thousands of terawatt hours. And it's split into our different types of power stations. We can see what contribution they're making to our electricity generation. So I'm going to first click Save. And then I'm going to click on Results. And I get an error. And it's because the feedstock fuel shares sum to zero. They must sum to 100%. So when I was creating my new power plants, I did not change the feedstock fuel share to 100%. So I'm going to go back to current accounts and I'm going to change the feedstock fuel share to 100%. Because 100% of our um, our fuel used in oil combustion turbines will be residual fuel oil, 100% in our new coal steam plants will be coal bituminous. So let's click save again and hope that it now calculates, and it does. So we want to view our electricity generation over time. Our graph here is in has um, has every year shown. So let's change our years to viewing all years. I can change the type of graph from a bar chart to an area chart as well, which is more similar to the graph here. But I'm looking at energy demand. I want to change the variable to outputs by feedstock fuel. And we can see that our outputs by feedstock fuel are now being split by fuel. I want them to be split by branch so that we can see our different types of power plants. And we can see that we get a similar graph to that shown in section 1.4.3. We have our existing coal steam shown in grey getting smaller in 2020 as the capacity reduces in half and then disappearing after 2030 uh, after all of the um, uh, uh, the existing coal steam are retired. Our hydro shown in yellow is relatively constant as are our existing oil combustion turbines. But as our electricity demand increases we get this large increase in the electricity generated from new coal steam and 
an increase in the new oil combustion turbines as well. We are now going to move on to section 1.5 where we add our greenhouse gas emissions into this, um, into this analysis. So I'm going to go back to the analysis view and we're going to use LEAP to estimate the emissions of major greenhouse gases for the baseline scenario for both current accounts and the baseline. We're going to enter the, the, um, the greenhouse gases using the IPCC tier one default emission factors stored in LEAP's technology and emissions database, TED database. We only want to enter the emissions for the pollutants that are emitted at, from the combustion of that fuel. So where there is electricity consumption in households, we are not going to enter emission factors in the household sector. Those emissions get accounted for under electricity generation. So to add the emissions in here, let's look for a um, technology like gas stoves where we have um, where we have um, emissions at the point of combustion. So we have it for gas stoves. To add in our emission factors, I'm going to click add multiple effects. And then what Leap does is look through the technology and emission database and tries to find the best um, emission factors to use. And they're suggesting natural gas in the residential sector, which seems good to me. It's then added in seven greenhouse gases and 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 greenhouse gases precursors um, into our analysis and we have this new tab called average environmental loading which contains the emission factors for the urban sector we don't have any other direct emission sources just electricity consumption in rural areas we have many more direct emission sources where we can add in the effects and it's being suggested to use charcoal um, residential here for charcoal stoves which sounds like a good first estimate for lpg it suggested oil residential we could select natural gas residential as a as a more appropriate value for wood suggested wood residential and this has been added in now then for lighting, we have kerosene. And it's suggested oil residential. We don't have kerosene here, so that seems like the most appropriate value. When we're creating um, um, real data sets for real countries or, or um, other locations, not Fredonia, we want to spend a lot more time evaluating the emission factors and selecting those that are most appropriate for the situation. I then need to add in the emission factors for my non-electrified households. So I'm going to choose the same ones. Charcoal residential. Natural gas residential. Wood residential. And then oil residential for kerosene. So that's my emissions under energy demand under electricity generation i enter my emission factors for each feedstock fuel so if i click add multiple effects under my existing coal steam i get suggested to use the coal emission factors hydro i don't have any direct emission factors associated with hydro but I do for oil combustion turbines. And it's suggesting to use the default oil emissions. Then for new coal steam, I'm going to right click, click add multiple effects and it's suggesting to use the coal emission factors.
and I'm going to right click add multiple effects and then add in the emission factors for residual fuel oil. So now I have my emission factors entered for each type of power plant. Then in section 1.5, we can view the results in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. So let's look at the graph that we then have there. Here we have a bar chart showing the every five years the greenhouse gas emissions split by demand and by transformation. So I click save. I'm now going to go to my results. And I'm going to try and create that chart. So I want to go back to using a, a bar chart. I want to see my results every five years. And I'm interested not just in demand and transformation. I'm interested in my greenhouse gas emissions. I can select different global warming potentials um, uh, to use. I'm going to select the 100 year global warming potential. At the moment, I'm only seeing the emissions associated with power generation. If I click on Fredonia new, I can then look at the emissions for um, all sectors. And if I reduce the levels to one, I have it split by demand and transformation as in the exercise. And I can see that the graph is the same as in, in the as, as in the exercise. We have the same greenhouse gas emissions as in section 1.5.1 of the exercise. If we move on to section 1.6, the final part of this exercise, we're now going to create a second scenario called demand side management, where we try and reduce our energy consumption and reduce the greenhouse gas emissions that are associated with that. So we're going to create the second scenario to explore the potential for energy conservation in Fredonia. To do this, I'm going to go back to analysis and click on my scenario screen. And I'm going to create a new scenario called demand side management. And I can add in my notes what is included in this scenario that we're going to create now. And it includes efficient lighting, transmission and distribution, loss reductions, and electric system load factor improvements. These are the mitigation measures that we're going to model. The important thing to note here is that the demand side management scenario is underneath the baseline. That means that before we make any changes, every um, expression for each variable is inherited from the um, from the baseline scenario. It's based on the baseline. That's really good because it means we then only need to evaluate or we only need to make changes to the variables that change in the demand side management scenario. Everything else stays the same as the baseline. This means that we only isolate the impact of the changes that we want to make. So then we're going to click close and I'm going to select now my demand side management scenario from the scenario menu because that's where I want to make the changes. The demand side management scenario consists of four policy measures. The first policy measure, new efficiency standards for refrigerators are expected to cut average intensities of refrigeration in urban households by 5% in 2020 compared to the current account values and by 20% in 2040. In rural households, intensities are expected to remain unchanged. So now I want to find out which branch and which variable is affected by this policy measure. And it's in households, it's in urban households and it's in refrigeration. And the variable that is affected is the energy intensity. 
And the energy intensity is reduced by 5% in 2020 compared to the value in 2010, the base year value, and by 2020, and by 20% 20 in 2040. So we can write that using an interp function. We can say interp 2020, and then we can write a little equation, base year value, that's the value in 2010, multiplied by 0 0.95. So that's 5% lower, it's 95% of the value in the base year. And by 2040, we can do the same thing base year value, and notice Leap doesn't uh, mind whether it's big or uh, capital letters or small letters, multiplied by 0 0.8. So once we've entered that, we can see we get this gradual improvement, gradual reduction in energy intensity. And we've now entered that policy measure, that improvement in the refrigeration intensity. Policy measure two. This is in the lighting sector. A range of measures, including new lighting standards and utility demand side management programs, are expected to reduce the energy intensity of electric lighting in urban households by 1% per year and to reduce the, respected, uh, the expected growth in electric lighting intensity in rural areas from 1% basically, uh, from 1 per year to 0.3% per year. So we've now got a, a, a policy measure which has different effects in urban and rural households. So we're going to reduce the energy intensity of electric lighting in urban households by 1% per year. So I'm now going to go to urban and electric lighting, and here I'm going to use the growth function, and you uh, enter a negative growth, minus 1% per year. And in, in the rural households, we then go from a 1% per year increase in the energy intensity of electric lighting, to a 0.3% per year increase. So if I then go to my rural areas, and I'm only interested in the electric house, uh, households because it's just electricity that I'm interested in, we can see that our baseline expression was growth 1% per year. And what this scenario will do is decrease that growth to 0.3% per year. Now we've entered policy measure two. Policy measure three covers the transmission and distribution sector. It says under the planned demand side management program, electric and electric transmission and distribution losses are expected to be reduced to 12% by 2025 and to 9% by 2040. So now I'm made, taking measures in my transformation sector, and I'm taking action um, on the electricity transmission and distribution losses. By 2025, they will be reduced to 12%. So I can change my inter function here from the baseline to say that that 12% reduction will not be achieved in 2040, but by 2025. And in 2040, it will be reduced to 9%, even further than in the baseline. So now I've entered that expression. Policy measure four in the uh, DSM scenario is various load factor improvements to our electricity generation system, which is going to de increase the system load factor to 64% in 2040. We're not going to enter this explicitly in LEAP, but we're going to create a new system load curve to represent these load factor improvements. To do this, we're going to go to our yearly shapes and we're going to add a new yearly shape called DSM load shape. And we're going to change this to percent of peak load. And we're going to enter in the data in the exercise to create our new system load shape.
and our minimum value is 30. So we've now entered the data to create our new load shape and we can see that it's much flatter than the original system load curve. So that's the first step to represent this scenario. Now what we need to do is to tell Leap that in 2040 we are going to, in our demand side management scenario, transition to that new system load uh, shape. So we're going to click on the E button and select yearly shapes and select DSM load shape for our demand side management scenario. And we then have an interpolation between the original load shape uh, to transition to this load shape in 20. So finally, in this exercise, we're going to go to section 1.6.1 to look at the results from the demand side management scenario. So we can look at the benefits that we get. I'm going to click save first and then click on results and we can now look at our different uh, graphs to show the results. So we can look at the avoided capacity for example shown on this graph looking at the demand side management versus the baseline scenario. So we can create different graphs to, to show this. So in this graph, we're looking at the capacity. So let's create this graph. It's an area chart and we have results being shown in all years across it. We're looking in the transformation sector and we want to look at our capacity in our transformation sector. We want to look at all capacity types. At the moment, the scenario we're looking at is the baseline, but we can change that to demand side management. And then we can make a comparison, avoided versus baseline. And you can see here that we have a large amount of capacity built avoided. So we can view our results to show the reduction in capacity. We can also look at reduction in greenhouse gas emissions and other um, and, and other variables between our two scenarios. So thank you very much for watching this um, tutorial and good luck in developing your own LEAP analyses. That's all for today. Be sure to join the LEAP Facebook group for all the latest news and subscribe to the LEAP YouTube channel to see LEAP videos and be notified as new ones become available. You can get access to both of those from leap.sei.org. Thanks for watching.